Why did Paul go through this suffering and this calamity through the shipwreck? I will offer you a truth here that that I think answers the, the whole question here. This morning we are in Acts chapter 28 verses 1 through 10. Acts 28, 1 through 10. And we're looking at Paul and his companions, Luke and Aristarchus, as they are on that ship from Alexandria, and they have been coming across the Mediterranean in a hurricane. And that hurricane ha- has put their lives at risk. They have lost the ship. They've had a shipwreck now, and they are landed on the island of Malta, on the island of Malta. Paul has experienced quite a bit of calamity at this point, quite a bit of suffering. You can imagine that as, as these 276 crew members come off of the boat, rather the pieces of the boat in the night or in the morning, early in the morning, and they are washing up on the shore and they're coughing up salt water and they're hanging on to driftwood as they come ashore and the people in the native island are looking at them. They must have been thinking, these guys have, have been through the ringer. They've been through an awful time and truly they had been. They'd been uh, two months on this trip. They had been 14 days in a hurricane. They had not eaten, but it seems one time time in those 14 days, and they thought they were about to lose their lives, but they finally listened to the man of God, and when they listened to the man of God, their lives were saved. That teaches us some very valuable lessons, doesn't it, about who we listen to. Now they come up on the island of Malta, and they they come across these native inhabitants. These native inhabitants begin to try to interpret, try to discern why this calamity has befallen the people, why it has befallen Paul and and the others who are there on the ship. This morning, I want to talk to you about how God uses calamity and suffering, how God uses calamity and suffering. And I want to charge you this morning, don't be too quick to try to interpret or discern somebody else's suffering. Don't be too quick to try to interpret or discern somebody else's suffering. That's exactly what these native islanders do. They try to interpret, well, why were these men going through this shipwreck? Why is their life preserved? And why why is Paul bitten by a serpent? They're trying to interpret, have they done something wrong? Have they done something right? Let me give you a quick story here. I heard a, a pastor share quite some time ago. There's a story told in Eastern folklore of this man who lost his horse that ran away. When the horse ran away, his neighbor came to him and said, You know, bad luck, isn't it? Your horse is gone. The man said, What do I know about these things? A few days later, the horse came back with 20 other wild horses. And the neighbor came and said, Amazing! It's not bad luck, it's good luck. You've got 20 more horses. The man says, what do I know about these things? His young son is going and taming one of the new horses, and a young horse kicks him and breaks his leg. The neighbor then comes and says, terrible, isn't it? Your son's leg is broken. Bad luck that these horses came. The fellow says, what do I know about good luck and bad luck? A few days go by, and a bunch of thugs come looking for recruits to join their gang And they're looking for all the able-bodied young men. They're about to pick this young man, but find out his leg is broken. And they said, we don't want him. We're going to move on to the next house. So the neighbor comes and says, good luck, isn't it? Your son's leg was broken. man says, good luck, bad luck. What do I know about these things? It's difficult to interpret somebody's situation, isn't it? Things that you think are good can actually be... Bad, things that happen that are bad can actually be for the good. And a lot of times we try to jump to a conclusion um, and we really, we just don't have the knowledge of God. We don't understand why calamity befalls certain people, why suffering comes on people at certain times. And we ought not be too quick to pass judgment on that or too quick to offer our own interpretation or our own discernment. What we ought to do is we ought to be gracious. This morning, I think that you can see two things, two ways in which God uses calamity and suffering in your life. Write this truth down uh, with me and you'll see those two. Calamity and suffering 
is an opportunity for God to demonstrate His power and grace to you and through you. Calamity and suffering is an opportunity for God to demonstrate His power and grace to you and through you. To you and through you. In one of these ways, to you, we're talking about how we view calamity that befalls us. Through you is how we are to view calamity befalling other people. And you're going to see, you're going to see this paradigm unfold here as a corrective measure here in the text. As I said, Paul has come off this boat that has been shipwrecked on the island of Malta, and the native people are going to try to figure out why these people were saved from the sea. They're very superstitious people. They're very worldly people. They're very much like many people that you and I come across here. It says this in verse 1 of chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, the hurricane that is, we then learned that the island was called Malta. Brother Jim likes Maltas. Where's Brother Jim? He likes Maltas, chocolate Maltas. But we're not talking about malts. We're talking about the island of Malta. The island of Malta is about 450 or 550, depending how, how straight you travel here. It's about 450 miles to the south of Rome. Quite spectacular, isn't it? Because we saw that that northeastern wind had been blowing on them as they were trying to go northwest. They were trying to go in the exact opposite direction that the wind was actually blowing. And yet when they finally gave up to God's will, God carried them right where he wanted them to go. And now they're right on their journey, right on their way, carried on the wings of God's sovereignty right there to the island of Malta. Now it says in verse 2, the native people showed us unusual kindness. The native people, hoi barbaroi is the term there. The native people, the barbarians, it is the literal rendering of that word. You know why they call people barbarians or where that word seems to have originated from? It seems to have originated as an onomatopoeia. It, it's, just, it's a word that sounds like what they're saying. So you come across somebody and you, you have no idea what language they're speaking. You don't know what they're saying. And all it sounds like is they're saying bar, 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 right? And so that's what they called them. They called them barbarians because that's what the, the language sounded like to them. They're, they're not in the Near East anymore. They're in Europe now. And they are on the island of Malta, which is inhabited probably mostly by Phoenicians at this point. These are people who are ruled over by the Romans, but they are not Roman in heritage, though they have inherited some of this Roman mythology. You'll see that in the way they understand this shipwreck here. But these are native people. The gospel has come to the barbarian. The gospel has come to the non-Jew. The gospel has come to the Greek. It has been moving around in the Greek and the Roman Empire, but now it is going to the far stretches of the Roman Empire, just 450 miles south of Caesar himself there in Rome, the center of the Roman world at the time. So these barbarians, these native people, showed us unusual kindness. Verse 2, For they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. The island of Malta is... For the most part of the year, it is known to be an island that is filled with green. It, it, it very rarely ever changes colors because it's normally in the warm. But in these winter months, it is known to get down in the upper 40s and the low 50s. And you know very well that if it gets down into the 40s and the 50s and you are soaking wet and that wind's blowing, it can sap the heat out of you very quickly. And so these men are getting out of the water. They're drenched to the bone. They don't have anything with them. They've lost all their possessions. They, in fact, they've jettisoned all the cargo off the side of the ship to free the weight up and to lift the boat up out of the water just a little bit. These men have nothing. They are torn, they're tattered, and they are soaking wet. And what do these native people do? They kindle a fire. And so it's a very simple gesture. But Paul says it was an unusual hospitality, an unusual philanthropy, an unusual kindness that these islanders are showing to this crew. They don't know where they've come from. They don't know anything about them other than they show up on their island and they're shipwrecked. They're going to treat these strangers very kindly. They kindled a fire and welcomed us because it had begun to rain and was cold. 
When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, look at this, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Maybe that viper had, had huddled up there in the sticks in the brush and it was kind of uh, frozen itself, a cold-blooded animal, and it would have been quite dormant and calm. And suddenly Paul throws that bundle of sticks there on the fire and I take it that that snake was warmed up by the heat of that fire. Snakes will do that, won't they? You warm them up by a little bit of heat and they'll come crawling out, won't they? There's a lesson in there somewhere, but we won't press it too hard. So the snake comes out and what does he do to Paul? He bites him right there on the hand. Fastens, it says. Fastens on his hand. Sinks its fangs down so deep into his hand that it's not just a, a strike and let go. This thing actually strikes and holds on to Paul's hand. Just sticks on him. And now the islanders are wide-eyed, and they don't know what's happening. They think they do, but they don't really know. A viper came out because of the heat, verse 3, and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. So you see their, their theology here working itself out? So if you're on the sea, according to them, if you're on the sea and you have a shipwreck, you have calamity, you have trouble, why is it? Justice is after you. The, the, the universe is writing itself here. Calamity has come upon you because you've done something bad. And that's why. So, so when they see these men coming through the sea, arriving on the shore, why do they show them great hospitality? Oh, because even though calamity was going to strike them, these men must be righteous men. Or else they would not have been saved from this calamity. So they show them unusual hospitality. Maybe the, maybe the gods, the false deities that is, maybe the gods favor these men. So they show them great hospitality. They're sitting around the fire. Paul throws on this bundle of sticks and a viper comes out, strikes them right there in the hand. And they say, oh, we, we've misinterpreted things. You were saved from the sea, not because your righteousness. You were saved from the sea by the skin of your teeth. And now justice has come after you. You might have escaped for a little while, but the universe has righted this wrong. The gods have come after you. Justice has not allowed you to escape. Now, in your, your text of Scripture here, justice, in fact, may actually be capitalized, isn't it? In many passages, it is actually capitalized because justice is used here as a noun. It is the word hey, dk. Hey, DK, and it is actually used to refer to a, a Roman mythological god. We would say Dice or Dice. Roll the dice there. Uh, the Latin name that's translated to is Justitia. Justitia. So Justitia or DK was the daughter in Roman mythology of Zeus. She was also the avenger of crime. And so what these, these barbarians are saying here is that though Paul has been saved from the sea, D.K. has chased him down, the avenger of crime, and she has given him a death sentence. Murderers get the death sentence. Therefore, there's no doubt that this man is a murderer. You know, there are many people who interpret calamity that way. Calamity has befallen you, bad circumstances, difficulties, sufferings has befallen you because you've done something wrong, because you've done something bad, the, the universe is starting to right itself. That's a false doctrine known as karma. That's what that is. I mean, we, we got to be careful because we find ourselves saying stuff like that. Good things come to good people, bad things come to bad people. That's not a doctrine of Scripture necessarily. That's a, that's a doctrine of this world is what it is. 
These people are believing in karma. They're believing in Roman mythology. Paul was spared from the sea, but justice chased him down. And this man has gotten what he deserves. You remember in the book of Job, as Job has faced serious calamity. It doesn't seem like anybody before him had suffered the same amount that Job had suffered. But you remember in Job chapter 8, really just the beginning of these complaints from his friends. He has three friends at first that come upon him, and they're going to offer him advice. And he responds them, some friends you are, miserable comforters, because what do they come and tell Job? One man in Job 8 tells him, Job, you are suffering because you have sinned, and your sins have been secretive, but your punishment has become public. Job, you need to repent, and if you'll repent, God will relent his hand. This friend is saying that God is being retributive towards Job. He's pouring out justice on Job so that Job will repent. And what does Job do all through the book? Job Job touts his innocence. And he says, I'm telling you, I have done nothing before the Lord. I am innocent before God. I don't know why this calamity has befallen me. I know that it's come from God, but I also know that it has not come because I've done something wrong. Because he says, as far as God knows and I know, I have done nothing wrong. But his friends tell him, no, Job, you're lying. No, Job, you've done something wrong to deserve this. You remember that Jesus' disciples in John chapter 9, they thought the same exact way. They come across a man who had been blind from birth, and as they come up to the man, Jesus doesn't heal him immediately. His disciples ask him, the disciples ask Jesus, is this man, was he born blind because of his own sin or because of his parents' sin? You see what their understanding is? Bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. I'm telling you, that is a false theology, and I'll show, you, I'll show you why it's false here in just a moment. But continue to look here. Continue to look here. It says this in verse 5, He, however Paul that is, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or to suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, They changed their minds. Well, they were real quick to pronounce a death sentence on him, weren't they? They were real quick to say, no doubt, this man is a murderer. Real quick to interpret his calamity. Real quick to interpret his bad times, his hard times. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. Boy, that's two extremes, isn't it? Mountaintop and the valley, right? This man is a murderer. He survived. Oh, this man's a god. Well, there's somewhere in between. He's just a man here. That, that's what he is. He, he's just a man. Has he been bitten by a viper because he's a murderer? Paul's done some things in his life, hasn't he? Paul has turned over Christians uh, back in his old life before he knew Jesus. He had turned Christians over to be killed, to be in prison. Paul was a persecutor of the people of God. Whether or not he actually ever laid his hand to a knife and killed a Christian, I don't know. But why was Paul bitten by a viper? Why did Paul go through this suffering and this calamity through the shipwreck? I will offer you a truth here that, that I think answers the, the whole question here. Verse 1 through 6, what you see is not God's retributive justice on Paul. What you see is God's power demonstrated on Paul. You're not seeing retribution. You are seeing grace. You are seeing God's power demonstrated on Paul. What did Jesus say in response to the disciples in John 9? When they were questioning about the man born blind, his sin or his parents' sin, what does Jesus say? He says, no, this man was born blind so that the power of God may be revealed through him. This man has experienced catastrophe in his life, an entire life with no sight. Why has he experienced it? So that God could demonstrate his power through this man, so that Jesus Christ, when he's walking along the road, can show all the multitudes that he is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He is worthy to be king over their lives. He's worthy to be king over Israel and over all the world. 
Be careful. Be careful how you interpret somebody's calamities. Be careful because you don't know why. You don't know why people are enduring difficulty. Could a person be enduring difficulty in their life because of poor life decisions? Well, absolutely, that is the truth. But I would, I would venture to say that a person could also be experiencing difficulty. This is verified by Scripture. They could be experiencing difficulty, calamity, strife. Why? Because God is demonstrating His grace and His power on them. Why have you encountered calamity? Why did our church flood? There's a lot of other buildings around here that could have flooded and they didn't flood. Why did Hillcrest flood? Why did this church experience such a hit from Harvey? Was it it because we had done something wrong? I don't believe that. I believe God's blessing has been on this church. I believe that God sent calamity our way because God was about to demonstrate His power to us. And we have seen nothing but time and again God demonstrate His grace and His power to this church. We've seen nothing but that. Be careful how we interpret calamity. Calamity can be an opportunity for God to demonstrate His power and His grace. It can be an opportunity for God to increase our faith. If everything is always easy, then why would we ever feel the need to trust in God? Sometimes God lets things get difficult so that we learn how to trust Him. Write this truth down with me. This is the first of two. Calamity in your life is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be demonstrated on you. Calamity in your life is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be demonstrated on you. As they changed their mind and they said he was a God. Now, there's nothing in this passage, no explicit response here in this passage by Paul to that accusation that he's a God. You remember in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra. And Paul has healed this man who has been crippled from birth. And you remember after he heals this man, what do the people in Lystra, the Lyconians, how do they respond? They say, these men are gods. And they call Barnabas Zeus and they call Paul Hermes because he's the chief speaker. And it says that that Paul and Barnabas were scarcely able to restrain these Lyconians from offering sacrifices to them. And they're telling them, we are not gods. It is the power of God that healed this man. But we are not gods. The point of the problem, the point of fixing the problem was not to elevate Paul. The point of the problem and the point of fixing the problem was to demonstrate the majesty and the grace of the Almighty God. That was the point of the problem. That's why calamity had befallen them. That's why difficulty had befallen them. So that through this entire thing, Paul is demonstrated to be the leader on that ship. Paul is demonstrated to be the prophet of God, the apostle of God. Why the difficulty? Well, without the difficulty, he's just a prisoner there. But when the lights turn out, suddenly that one light is able to shine bright. The light of God shining through the Apostle Paul. Calamity in Paul's life was used by God to demonstrate his power on him. That was the purpose of the calamity. I want to challenge you to to revisit how you think about the struggles and the difficulties that that have encountered you, that you have encountered, why they have come on you. Have they come on you because God does not favor you? Have they come on you because you've done something wrong? Or have they come on you because God does favor you? Have they come on you because God wants to show you something about himself that he's never shown you and you're not going to see it? If you're walking in times of ease. Who is it that told the disciples to get in the boat and go out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee without him? Jesus. Did Jesus know that the storm was coming? Yes. He's the master of the sea. He's the one that calmed the sea. Which tells me he's also the one that stirred the sea. 
But who sent them out on the sea? Jesus did. Jesus sent them headlong into calamity because if they're not on the sea during the storm, they don't get to see the power of God to calm the storm. And the people who were living it up easy on the shore never saw Jesus walk on the water. They never saw Jesus calm the storm with a word of his mouth. Never saw it. So were they going through the storm because of retribution? Because they were getting their comeuppance? No. They were going through a storm because God in His grace sent them into it. Because God was going to reveal a special amount of grace to them. Why has God brought calamity on your life? I'll tell you. God has brought calamity on your life. He's allowed it to come to you because God wants to demonstrate a special amount of grace to you. So now, when you pray, ask the Lord. So Lord, I'm not necessarily asking you to take these troubles away from me, to take these sufferings away from me. Lord, you know better than I do. But Lord, I want to ask you to help me to see your hand in this. Lord, help me to understand your grace in this. Lord, help me to know you better. And God may very well remove that suffering. He may very well leave that suffering. But what I know he will do for sure is he will show you his grace. He will show you. That is a prayer. I've told you this many times. I tell you many prayers that I know God will answer. That is a prayer that God will answer. If you, will sh- if you will tell him, Lord, I want to depend on your grace through this, would you teach me how? That is a prayer that God is delighted to answer. Calamity in your life is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be demonstrated on you. Now look at verse 7 through 10. It's not God's power demonstrated on Paul. Now what you see is God's power demonstrated through Paul. Look at this. This is very interesting here. See, see the comparison. It's good to divide this into two paragraphs because then you can see the parallel comparison that I think is being drawn here. Verse 7. Now, in the neighborhood of that place, same island, now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Something parallel here, isn't there? The native islanders, they receive the people from the shipwreck. They kindle a fire. They're ministering to to the the men who have come off this ship. What happens after that? Calamity. Look at that. Now they go and and they're entertained by the chief of the island, Publius. Now look at verse 8. It happened, here it is, calamity, that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. You can look that up on your own. And Paul visited him and prayed. Putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to set sail, or about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. So here it is again. The the men off the shipwreck are treated kindly, now by the chieftain, now by Publius. And his father becomes very sick. He's got a fever. He's got dysentery. He can't hold anything down in his stomach, as it were. He's just losing it. He's even losing blood, possibly. And this could be a deadly disease that this man is fighting. They're, they're not, they don't have modern medicine where they can take some antibiotics and take an IV and replenish those fluids like that. This man is about to die. Now... Let me ask you a question. How how was Paul treated when he encountered calamity? What did people think? He's a murderer. He's a murderer. And everybody sits around and watches. When's this guy going to croak? When's this guy going to die? He did something bad. Let's watch him die. Publius' father encounters calamity. What does Paul do? Does Paul say... Must be a murderer. Must have done something bad. I'm going to sit around and wait and see if this man with a fever and dysentery dies. Let me see if justice gets this man. Is that what Paul did? What does Paul do? He goes to the man. He doesn't sit around and wait. 
He sees a man suffering and he goes to him. And what does he do? Does he say, oh, God's come down on you because you're a barbarian. You're a sinner. You're a pagan. What does Paul do? He goes up to him, lays his hands on him, and he prays to God. That's Paul's response to their accusation that he's a God. No, he's praying to God. Paul is a man of God. He lays his hands on this man, not hands of retribution, not hands of condemnation, not hands of judgment. He lays hands of grace on him. He says, oh oh God, merciful Lord, would you please heal this man? Not because of anything that he has done, but because you are kind and you're gracious and you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Oh, Lord, I pray you would spare his life. Lord, don't give this man justice because we all deserve to die. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, Lord, don't give this man justice. Give this man what? Give him grace. Give him grace, Lord. Would you heal him? You see the difference in the way that the islanders viewed calamity and the way Paul viewed calamity? The islanders viewed calamity on Paul as judgment. When the truth is, it was an opportunity for God to demonstrate his grace on Paul. Now when calamity hits one of the islanders, Paul doesn't view that as judgment. Paul views that as an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power through him. See, that first paragraph, verse 1 through 6, that tells us how to view calamity in our life. Verse 7 through 10 tells us how to view calamity in other people's lives. When you see somebody else suffering, what's your first reaction? Well, if they'd have just made better decisions when they were younger. Ooh, really? What about you? We all make wise decisions when we were younger? Hmm, Lord help us. No, we didn't. So maybe we ought not be so quick to say that. Maybe we ought to be more like Paul in this and say, hey, this calamity that's befallen you, God can show his grace to you. God can show his power to you through this. God's not here to condemn you, brother. God's not here to pass judgment on you, sister. God's here to love you. Jesus came to love you. Look what it says in James chapter 1. Verse 2 through 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Paul says that's, that's the reason. That's the reason that you have encountered this suffering and this trial So that God can produce faith in you. God God shows you your need. That's what he does. God did this in Paul's very own life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is given to humble him. To humble him. God sends him a messenger. He puts a thorn in Paul's flesh. And Paul prays three times. says, Lord, would you remove this suffering? Would you remove this calamity? Would you remove this difficulty from me? And what does the Lord say? He says, no, Paul. Don't ask about it again. You need to learn that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul, you need to learn to depend on me. Paul goes to this man, learning these lessons. He says, friend, God wants to show his grace to you. God's not here to to send you to hell. God's here to save you. Why did God send Paul to Malta in the first place? Paul is his apostle. He's his messenger of the gospel that God saves sinners. Look at what Jesus says. Our favorite verse in the Bible. But a lot of times we miss the verse that comes after it. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever would believe in him might have a life. We should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. That's why God sent Jesus. 
He didn't send Jesus to make everybody look bad. We already look bad. He sent Jesus to save sinners. God is not interested in the here and now giving people what they deserve. That's the point of the gospel. God gave Jesus what we deserve. God poured out on Jesus his justice so that he can give us grace. God treats Jesus as the murderer whose heel is struck by the serpent, Genesis 3. He's not treating Paul as a murderer. He treated Jesus that way. Paul is free from this. And now this man who was once without the gospel, now he experiences the gospel through Paul. God is not here to judge you. God is here to heal you. And I would have to believe that Paul shared the good news of Jesus with him, that anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus, that God is not interested in giving you justice. But if you ask God to forgive you of your sins, God places all that on Christ and he gives you grace. That's what God is interested in doing in our lives. So Paul sees the calamity on this other man differently. He sees it as an opportunity to minister to the man. So that friend, that coworker, that person who lives nearby, that person that you know of that's going through a difficult time, why are they going through it? The answer is, you don't know. I don't know why they're going through it. But I do know God's purpose in it for you. God's purpose in allowing them to go through the calamity and you to know about it is to make you able to minister to that person. Calamity in other people's lives, truth number two, is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be demonstrated through you. Calamity in other people's lives is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be demonstrated through you. And so here it is that Paul demonstrates God's grace. And what do all the people on the island do? They're going to partake of the grace as well. They start flooding there to Paul so that Paul can heal them. Rather, God can heal them through Paul. You see, when, you, when you're demonstrating God's grace through you to other people, you know what God's likely to do? God's likely to multiply that ministry there. God's likely to make you to be a minister of grace, not just to that person, but to many people. That's what happened here for Paul. And then verse 10, what do they get? The people of the island, they're so thankful, they're so glad, they're so grateful. And so they start to give them everything that they need for the rest of their journey. Here's God, not only providing the ministry of the gospel to these people on the island, but he's also providing for all these men who came on this ship, and chiefly, he's providing for his minister. He's providing for the Apostle Paul so that he can take him the last leg of his journey there to, Mal- there to Rome from Malta. Now, zoom out with me here for just a moment, and let's not look at Malta as some isolated incident. Zoom out with me, and let's take a 30,000-foot view here for just a moment and see what the purpose of the, the hurricane, the viper bite, what's the purpose of all of those things here? If you you think about this, just zooming out here to look at the Apostle Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, what do you begin to see? You begin to see this simple truth, that God's kingdom is advancing, and that there is no trouble in this earth or from the devil's hand that will stop or even slow down the advancement of the gospel. You got Christians killed in Jerusalem. You got Stephen stoned to death there in Jerusalem. What happens? The gospel spreads to Samaria. You've got Paul here going to persecute Christians in Damascus, and God saves him. And now you have a preacher in Damascus. The gospel is not hindered. You see that there is no persecution that's going to stop the advancement of the kingdom. Paul was persecuted by the Jews in Jerusalem, and he was persecuted by the Jews in every single city that he went to. He was stoned at Lystra. 
He was beaten with rods in Philippi. He was chased out of Thessalonica. He was hunted in Berea. Persecution will not stop the advancement of God's kingdom. There's no government interference that slows down or stops the advancement of God's kingdom. Paul was imprisoned there in Philippi. He was arrested in the temple. He's dragged before the Roman tribune. He's put before the Jewish council. He's sent to the Roman governor, Felix. He was escorted by 200 Roman soldiers. He was paraded before King Herod Agrippa II, and he was held captive in Caesarea Philippi for two years. No government interference will slow down or stop the advancement of God's kingdom. There's no earthly force or power of hell that will slow down or stop the advancement of God's kingdom either. Paul had likely been experiencing illnesses all throughout. That's what he says there in his writings, that he appears to them in weakness and in ailments. Paul has experienced illnesses all throughout his journeys. He has received criticism from those within the church and those without the church. He's received opposition at every turn. He's experienced a hurricane at sea and even now a deadly hurricane bite. And what has God done? God has preserved his man because God's kingdom advancement is not slowed down or stopped by anything. The gospel is going to the barbarian. The gospel is going to us. The gospel's going to the ends of the earth. Friends, the message of the book of Acts is that God's gospel goes to all people. And it is a gospel not of meritocracy. It is not a gospel of things that you deserve, because if God gave us justice, we'd be in hell. The gospel is a ministry of grace, not to people who deserve it, but to people who don't deserve it. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost, not those who deserve it. That's why Paul went to Publius' father-in-law and he heals him. That's why Paul heals all these people coming to him on this barbarous island. Why? Because that's God's love shown through his hand. Calamity and suffering is an opportunity for God to demonstrate His power and His grace to you and through you. And here now on this last leg of the Apostle's journey to Rome, you see him riding on the wings of God's sovereign hand through calamity, through struggle, through strife. Because God's kingdom's not going to be stopped as it's advancing in this world. Would you pray with me?